Welcome back U.S. History students. Today we are going to be looking at specifically the Spanish-American War and I'm actually joined in the classroom by your first block classmate Brandon over here. Brandon yell out hello to the rest of the class. Hi. Hi. Brandon says hi and when he rewatches this video tonight you're gonna hear yourself. It's not really fun to hear uh, your own voice Brandon just to let you guys know. I don't like to rewatch these videos that I make but uh, you know, I do, I do it for you guys, and I do it specifically for Brandon in this case. So, back on topic, we are going to start talking about the Spanish-American War. Something you've probably heard about before, but may have no idea that we actually fought a war against Spain in 1898. And it all focuses around two areas of the world that are relatively close to the United States. The country of Cuba specifically, and also Puerto Rico, which are two islands just off the coast of the United States. Cuba is only 90 miles off the coast of Florida. And if we think back to the um, Monroe Doctrine, we flat out told Europe that we cannot have any of them invading countries or taking over countries that are close to the United States. We said, stay out of our territory. Well, Spain had already taken control of Cuba, and we were getting pretty sick of it. And in fact, the Cubans were getting sick of it as well. So the United States would like to have Spain out of Cuba, and Cubans and the Cuban people were sick of having Spain involved in their country as well. They really wanted to be independent from Cuba. It They were pretty sick of... Uh, having to be controlled by an outside nation. No country likes to be controlled by another. And they thought to themselves, hmm, maybe we should start fighting against the Spanish and see if we can become independent and rid them of our, just get them out of our country, become independent. Um, and many American citizens and businessmen supported that as well. We had a lot of business interests going on in Cuba. It would make it a lot easier if the Spanish didn't control them, if they were their own country in order to deal with them. And the American people were like, you know what, it would be good if we could uh, liberate this country from Spanish control because they should be their own people. Spain didn't like that very much, so they sent this man here, Valeriano Weiler, they sent him to Cuba to try and kick and crush down the Cuban uh, revolutionary forces. In fact, he basically just started dropping bombs. <laughs> Figuratively, not literally, because we don't have massive large-scale bombs to drop at this time, but he goes in there with his forces and he starts trying to put down this Cuban revolution that's going on, their fight for independence. And he puts them in concentration camps. He puts the Cuban people into these camps kind of like this. We need to build a wall. He needed to build a wall around all of uh, the people in Cuba and many of them died due to harsh conditions and poor treatment while they were in these concentration camps. These aren't a good thing no matter who you are. They don't look positive to the rest of the world. And we have journalists in the United States who are starting to get wind of this. And the United States government starting to get wind of it. And the United States needed to find a way to justify how we could get involved in this war effort to get Spain out of Cuba and maybe gain control of it ourselves. And journalists thought, hmm, how can we sell newspapers? And this is where we get that concept of yellow journalism coming out during this time. Yellow journalism, its strict definition is the exaggeration of news to gain viewers and readers. Basically it means that we're publishing untrue facts in the media to the American people about things that are going on around the world. At this time we want to sell to the American people the idea that war with the Spanish will be a good thing. People don't like going to war. We just spent a bunch of money uh, purchasing Alaska. We just spent a bunch of time in Hawaii, and that turned into a mess for a while. And on top of that, we have problems from the Industrial Revolution. We have problems from immigration. We have problems from urbanization. We have all these immigrants coming, and we have a bunch of issues here at home. 
and the United States people were like, we should not get involved in a war anywhere else in the world. There's just no possible way that we can handle doing that right now. We need to focus in here at home. And the United States government was like, man, I don't know uh, how we're going to sell this war to the American people. How are we going to stir up war fever? How are we going to get a chance to do this? But there is a way. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! And that's what so the American government said and thought. Once journalists began to figure out a way to start selling information and selling ideas to the American people. In 1898, a U.S. battleship called the USS Maine, which is pictured right here, the USS Maine exploded unexpectedly, and people didn't really understand why the ship blew up. We just spent a bunch of money building it. Why did it blow up? Well, it blew up due to some sort of industrial accident, a gas leak that was really nobody's fault. But the media didn't report that. What they reported to the American people in newspapers all over the country was that Spain was behind the explosion, and Spain was behind the blowing up of the USS Maine. That's a pretty good reason to sell to the American people that war is necessary against the Spanish. And that's exactly what happens. We have yellow journalism today. Remember when Ebola and that virus was sweeping all across Africa and people were scared that it was going to come to the United States? Here's a magazine cover. Ebola is coming, written in what looks like blood. This is meant to scare people, exaggerate its effects. Ebola really had no real chance of sweeping through the United States and turning us all into basically zombies. But this is what the media still does today. This is an example of modern day yellow journalism. So we send troops into Cuba to try and fight against the Spanish, all in the name of giving Cuba their independence. Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders, they organize together, they're sent to Cuba. They don't actually really do anything during the Battle of San Juan Hill. They're set, it's said that they were this really mighty military group and they did all these great things during this battle, but it didn't actually happen. What it did is it made a great story for the media when we see a U.S. volunteer group led by a man like Teddy Roosevelt, who wasn't president yet, but was gaining popularity. The fact that he went there and started fighting against the Spanish made a great story. Yellow journalists exaggerated their role, and they came back as heroes. And we started kicking butt there. We destroyed all the Spanish ships, and we became victorious. As the uh, end of the war got closer, we actually took over the island of Puerto Rico, which becomes pretty important to our story. So in 1898, the war officially ends with the Treaty of Paris. The U.S. was given control of Guam and Puerto Rico, Guam being another island country out in the Pacific. We get control of Guam and Puerto Rico, and the island nation of Cuba is made free. They are their own independent nation now. The Cubans were successful with our help in gaining their independence. This is controversial for a couple of reasons. One, people in the United States were like, hey, we just took Hawaii, we just bought Alaska, we do not need Puerto Rico and Guam, two more island countries to take care of. We should solve our issues here at home. We should focus in on that. But the U.S. government did not listen to the American people. We wanted to expand our territory, expand our power, and that's exactly what we did. Puerto Rico was hoping that maybe we would give them their independence as well, or maybe we could make them a full state of the United States. Neither of this happened. We ruled initially with our military, and Puerto Rico never has become a complete uh, state within the United States. All right, sorry for all these interruptions, U.S. history students. You guys deserve better than that, but the show's got to go on. So the Puerto Ricans wanted to become maybe part of the United States or independent. Either one uh, would have worked. The... Puerto Ricans never got their wish on either side of it. The U.S. government gave Puerto Rico their own technically independent government, but we still remained in control of them through our president, and that's still in effect today. Puerto Rico is what we call a territory or a commonwealth, meaning we're in control of them, but we're also not in control of them. They have some power, but they're not full, um, fully independent in their own country. 
they're considered American citizens, but people in Puerto Rico cannot vote for president. And this whole idea and this whole controversy is in Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans are conflicted on whether to want to become a full state of the United States and get all of those wishes, but then they're going to give up their culture, just kind of like in Hawaii. They're kind of their own nation, but they also do not want to be fully independent because then they don't get any assistance from the United States. We'll look at that more in class. The next thing we have to look at is Cuba. Cuba was, as we said before, considered independent after the um, end of the Spanish-American War. But the U.S. military was still there occupying the country. We gave them a bunch of technology. We improved their infrastructure. We gave them um, just improvements in sanitation and everything like that. But there were many people in, the, in Cuba at the time who were like, you know what, the United States is here and they're doing all of these things and we really want to do them on their own, but we don't want to go against the United States because they just crushed the people that were here before. So they're obviously pretty strong. So Cuba didn't really know what to do. They were technically independent, but the United States was definitely still there. In 1900, Cuba wrote its own constitution to set up its own government. And how rude of them, they actually didn't mention the United States at all in their constitution. How could another country write their own constitution for their own people and not mention the United States? Well, obviously, the U.S., after helping them gain their independence, was not just going to let that slide. So what we did is we forced them to adopt something called the Platt Amendment within their constitution that listed four things that Cuba could not make treaties that limited its independence or gave control to another country, so they couldn't welcome Spain back and say, hey, take control again, that the United States has the right to intervene in Cuban affairs, meaning if we don't like something they're doing, we can intervene. Cuba could not go into a debt that they could not pay, so basically the United States can control Cuba's money, and that we could put naval bases in Cuba. That essentially tied us to the nation of Cuba and made it so we were in heavy control of their government. So while they're technically an independent country, this is another imperialist action that we take. We're going to heavily influence their government and what their people are doing. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. Thanks for watching despite the interruptions and be prepared to talk about this in class tomorrow.